We now move on to Book 6 of Avicenna's Metaphysics. Some of the materials that I'm going to discuss from Book 6 are rather complex, so you might find it valuable to view this video presentation again, download it again yourselves, and look at it uh, individually. For the group presentation, though, given the amount of time we have, I have uh, quite a number of things to cover. But let's proceed. So, Avicenna Met Metaphysics, Book 6, Chapter 1. In the previous video lecture, then, I discussed Avicenna's teaching on necessity and possibility, and his establishment of the Wajib al wujud that is the necessary being, the Nechese essay, God, here, in this case. And that was in Metaphysics, Book 1, Chapters 5 through 7. For clarity's sake, let me mention here that the necessary being discussed is necessary for the explication of the actual existence of the possibles of the world. Here the implication is not that it, is, uh, that it causes all things with a kind of necessitarian determinism. That's a distinct issue. In the account we find here, the primary notion of necessary in the mind in relation to at least one experience of a real thing in the world leads to the division of all into necessary and possible and ultimately to the assertion of the existence of the necessary being. That is to say, Avicenna's argument is not completely a priori, built just on the concepts within the human mind. Rather, they require reference to the existence of at least one thing in the world. And on the basis of the analysis of that one thing, then he gives the account of the world. If that one thing is the necessary being itself, then it needs no further explanation. If it's a quiddity which is possible in itself, then it requires an explanation as to how it became instantiated in the world. Since our concern is with the philosophical issues of creation of Avicenna, then, as I say, we turn now to Book 6, Chapters 1 through 3. Next class, I'll continue with Metaphysics 8, Chapters 1 through 5, and also Book 9, Chapters 1 and 4. These, together with Metaphysics 1, Chapters 5 through 7, constitute the most important text for the Metaphysics of Avicenna relating to this notion of creation that we're concerned with here. In this regard, I would mention to you the value of the index for uh, Marmora's translation. This could be quite valuable to you as you do your course papers. So we begin our study of Metaphysics 1 with, of course, the final paragraph. Why? Because Avicenna explains what he sees himself to have accomplished in this. This helps then for us to see exactly what in detail he establishes along the way. So we start here first. And this is paragraph 17 in Marmora's translation. Hence, if it is clear that the existence of the quiddity is connected with what is other inasmuch as it is an existence for that quiddity, not inasmuch as it is something that comes to be after not having been, then that existence in this respect is caused so long as it exists. Close quote. So what's Avicenna up to here? Well, Avicenna's concern is that the quiddity, that it be established that the quiddity is caused by something outside of itself. He emphasizes the issue, the issue of importance is not just that the quiddity came into existence after not existing, that is, that it's created, but rather the concern is that it continues to be dependent in being on what made it to be. Hence his comment at the end of the, of the translation, then that existence in this respect is caused so long as it exists. So it continues to be in the state of needing existence from another. He goes on, quote, Likewise, it is an effect connected with what is other. Thus it becomes evident that the effect needs that which bestows existence on it by essence, conferring only existence itself. But it becomes evident also that origination and other things are matters that occur to it accidentally, and that the effect needs that which bestows existence on it always, permanently, as long as the effect exists. So he's emphasizing here the notion of ontological dependence. That is, first, the cause of beings must be an agent cause, enacting the being of things by efficient causality, other than the efficient causality of motion. That is, it must do so by a metaphysical causality. 
Second, its action is the cause of being in something other than itself and comes from that giver of being to the thing from outside the thing which comes to exist. This distinguishes the two into distinct entities. Third, that causality cannot be discontinuous or episodic, but must be continuously present and active for all beings other than the first. In Islamic Kalam, the atomistic notion was present. There was an, an, atom, an atomistic notion was present that was also part of the Islamic notion of occasionalism. And by this I mean that nothing had in its own right the ability to persist in existence, but only for the atomic moment in which God created it. So God would have to recreate things to give the appearance of continuity, when in fact things were discontinuous because things other than God did not have anything of themselves to enable them to persist in existence, continuously needing it, or episodically rather, needing it from God again and again and again. The fourth point then, this is the notion of creation properly speaking according to Avicenna. That is the notion of continuous ontological dependence on something outside of itself. The same thing is said by Thomas Aquinas. Creation is not so much about the novelty of something as the continuous continuance of something in being, receiving its being from something else. How then is this chapter, book six, chapter one, structured? Paragraph two is about the four causes of Aristotle, formal, material, agent, and final. But in paragraph two, Avicenna breaks the agent cause into two sorts, metaphysical and physical. And he also mentions there that the metaphysical philosophers know the difference between agent causality and physical causality. Agent causality as metaphysical, agent causality as physical, are clearly distinguished by the metaphysical philosophers, says Avicenna. His point is that the metaphysical agent causes the existence of something else outside of itself and does not give itself, or a part of itself, to another thing, but rather causes the other thing to exist in its own right. As Aristotle puts it in Physics Book 3, the actuality of the agent is in the patient. That is, it's in the recipient. Why does Avicenna do this? As I see it, he does it to forestall the possibility of pantheism, a pantheistic interpretation, whereby the cause gives something of itself to another thing, and or just extends itself further in the world, such that all is God. I believe that's what Avicenna is responding to here. Paragraph 3 reinforces the separate nature of the agent from the effect to avoid the effect just being part of the agent. His last sentence of the paragraph makes his last sentence of the paragraph makes exactly this distinction. Paragraph four considers the notion that there are five causes. We already saw that idea with the agent cause broken into two, but that's not what Avicenna has in mind. He has another idea that's very important for him. So he considers the notion that there are five causes. Uh, if the thing caused uh, to exist is considered as it is before it exists, that is, if what receives existence is considered somehow existent before it receives existence. The sense is that something has to be in order to receive. And the notion also comes from the Quran and the notion that God said to things, be, and they were. What is the ontological status of those things before God said be to them? Can God say be to something that doesn't exist in any way? I think Avicenna's concern is to get language uh, settled here appropriately and also to deal with an issue in Islamic theology. So, he has in mind then both issues in Islamic theology and also the problem of language and discourse about the ontological status of possible beings or just things that we say come to receive existence. And what does it mean to say they receive existence? I think quite a bit of what he's doing is to explain that non-existent things, while we may express them in language by use of a noun, nevertheless, they are only conceptual reality. 
existence. They only have conceptual existence and not reality in the world. So there is not an existing non-existence of some kind, but rather this is only a conceptual notion. Paragraph 5 considers formal cause and its relation to matter, the matter it informs or actualizes. It is the cause of being for matter as form, for matter, but it is not part of the intrinsic structure of matter itself, says Avicenna. Quote, form hence is only a form for matter, not a formal cause of matter. The sense seems to be that the bestowal of form is part of agent-efficient causality involving the giving of existence as the giving of what something is as well as the giving of being. This notion that form is not the formal cause of matter has the sense then that it is not something formally present in matter but something that comes to matter. So it is a form for matter but not a form of matter structuring the very essence of matter from the beginning. Paragraph 6 makes it clear that the giving of existence in agent causality is not the giving of a part of the agent to something else. That is, it is not pantheism. So in paragraph 7, Avicenna writes, Therefore, if non-existence belonged to it from itself, it then follows necessarily that its existence came to be after non-being. It thus became a being after not being. That is, the giving of existence, which is creation, means that the so-called recipient of itself had and continues to have non-existence, and just is not, of itself, when considered only regarding what it has in its own nature or in its own right. Hence, in paragraph 8, quote, what, has, what it has essentially, bibatihi, is existence, al close quote, which is derived to it from what has existence essentially. The caused thing is only possible of existence, but if existence has a cause, must not non-existence also have a cause? No, says Avicenna. His concern here is the theological one, then, because in the atomistic theology there was also the notion that, that God was giving being to something as a kind of accident to it. And so, being is given to the non-existent thing, and then the thing is. And then non-being must be given to it, or the accident of destruction must be given to it, in order to destroy it. Avicenna wants nothing of this with his own metaphysics. In paragraph 9, he writes, quote, If someone asks, this case is the same with its existence after its non-existence. It is possible to be and possible not to be. Then we say, and then Avicenna gives his own account in paragraph 10. There he says that it is no longer a pure possible of non existence, but rather remains a possible, but a possible made to or necessitated to exist by its cause. So even after the thing is originated or created or given existence, then it remains in need of something outside of it to continue its, its necessitation in existence. Paragraph 11. But once it has existence, does this not belong to it fully per se? No. Rather, it remains in the condition of needing existence from its cause. That is, all created reality remains in its own right in need of conservation in being. All reality remains in ontological dependence on the agent cause of all being. Hence, it becomes very clear what I had said in the beginning by going to the last paragraph of this. Avicenna's major concern in this chapter, uh, and in this, uh, this chapter, first chapter, is the notion of ontological dependence. So in 11 and 12, there is this argument for continuous conservation. And then in paragraph 13, Avicenna draws the conclusion, I quote, But it has become clear that that whose existence is possible in itself exists through another, so that all the attributes become necessary through another that is external to them. Okay? The second alternative necessitates that 
the originated existence remain in existence only through an external reason, namely the cause. Close quote. So, the continuous state of ontological dependence of things other than the necessary being upon the actuality of existence received by agent causality from the necessary being is what's at stake here. In paragraph 15, then, Avicenna describes creation. Quote, Hence, a thing inasmuch as its existence is originated, hadithum, that is, inasmuch as the existence belonging to it is described as being after privation, in reality has no cause. Rather, the cause belongs to it inasmuch as the quiddity has existence. So the thing is going to receive its existence through its quiddity. Thus, the state of affairs is the opposite of what they think. Indeed, the cause is only for existence. If it so happens that non-existence precedes it, then it is originated, hadithun, or hadithun, and if it did not happen so, it would not be originated. So in this notion of origination, in the translation, origination, we understand creation, or created. Paragraph 16 raises the very important question of whether the agent is called an agent only insofar as it's related to the effect. Here, I think Avicenna is engaged with the religious notion of creation, and the question of whether the agent or creator is agent or creator only through a relation to an effect, or to, to the created things. Were there no created things, there would be no creator. It's an interesting issue in itself. So, then, uh, would the agent be an agent always, or in conjunction with the effect? Is the effect part of the definition of the agent as agent, or is the first cause itself an agent in its own right? That's a very important issue. I believe the kind of thing that Avicenna is dealing with here, and we'll see it in the next slides, I believe the kind of thing he's dealing with here is the question of temporal creation, and whether it makes any sense to say that God created the world a finite number of years prior to the present. That is, God, who is eternal, created the world when God decided to give a beginning to the world and time. Avicenna is going to argue something quite different in what I believe is, or what seems to me anyway, to be an attack on the uh, the Christian notion, the Abrahamic notion of creation in time. So, paragraphs 1 through 6 of chapter 2 of book 6, why is there something rather than nothing? That's the theme. What kind of question is that? That's what Avicenna is very much concerned with. This is not a question about why there is this or that particular thing. Quote, from Avicenna, the question why does not pertain to these things at all. Close quote. That is, this concern is about why there are things at all. Why is there something rather than nothing? And the account will go back to the first cause of all, the necessary being. In, in paragraph 7 to 8, he talks about essential causes of existence and asserts that they must exist together with their effects, but not the non-essential causes. He says, quote, the regress of causes that are not essential or not proximate does not prevent their proceeding ad infinitum. His notion here is then, as, the, as we might say, a kind of horizontal notion of generation and an infinite number of causes uh, in that horizontal range doesn't bother Avicenna at all. He sees no problem with that, given that God is, is infinite, the world is eternal, God is eternal. But the idea that there could be a hierarchical or ontological dependence involved in, in, in a kind of intermediary that has an infinite number of essential causes, he thinks is impossible. He provides this analysis for two reasons. Number one, to emphasize ontological dependence on the accidental, that is extrinsically caused, nature of the giving of existence. And two, I believe, to set up the reasoning that the necessary being must be an eternally active cause of the world, 
not acting by will and not acting temporally, but eternally. So I ask the question, what is so, por so important about this second notion? If it's necessary from the notion of the first cause as agent cause, that it always be active, if it act immediately in virtue of its very being, as we saw earlier with the Aratiplotinus material and the Vigate causes, if it acts autal ta enai, then there seems to be no room for will, which is a traditional attribute of God, set forth in the Abrahamic the philosophers, the philosophies of the Abrahamic traditions. And also it raises the question of whether it's at all possible for there to be a temporal beginning of the world. It's a quite important topic and well worthy of a course paper. Paragraph 9. The cause that prevents a thing from lapsing into non-existence. Quote, it is the one that gives complete existence to the thing. This then is the meaning that for the philosophers is termed creation. If that Notice what Avicenna has just given us here. He's given us a definition. It's important because philosophers always have to be on the watch in argumentation, on the watch for definitions. Here is a definition. Avicenna continues. It is the giving of existence to a thing after absolute non-existence. For it belongs to the effect in itself to be non-existent and then to be, by its cause, existing. Close quote. The short passage of Aquinas from the Commentary on the Sentences, Book 2, that we looked at some time ago, I believe is dependent upon this particular paragraph of Avicenna. Paragraph 10. The term originated, al muhtathi is applied to each thing that has existence, isa, after non-existence, lysa, writes Avicenna. What does this language reveal? It reveals that Avicenna is, in, is engaged with, is, with issues from the time of Alkindi, from the circle of Alkindi, that is, with issues found in the Plotiniana Arabica and also the Libre Causes. Why? Because of the vocabulary of existence and non-existence here. Isa and Lysa are vocabulary from that period, prominent during that early period of Islamic thought. So Avicenna is engaged with an issue here that arises in 9th century Baghdadi metaphysics. And that is the issue of the use of this term, creation, or ibda, as we'll see. So paragraph 11. Time is not an issue here. Quote, if its existence were after absolute non-existence, then its proceeding from the cause in this manner would be creation, ibda, And it would represent the highest mode of giving of existence, because non-existence would have been utterly prevented existence being fully empowered over it. There's a little bit more to this now, though. In paragraphs 12 to 13, then, contrary to the pre avicennian account we saw in the Plotiniana Arabica and the Libre de Causis, where creation was to be attributed only to the first cause of being of all things, Avicenna here argues that it is proper to call the existential causality of intermediates creation. So what he's proposing is an extension of the vocabulary of creation away from just an activity of the one single first principle to the notion that creation takes, essentially takes place with regard to other things. So in the Avicennian hierarchy of emanation, from the first and then to the second, the second creates the third, etc., Avicenna asserts that there is a genuine creation, a giving of existence where there was no existence before. So Avicenna holds for a mediate a doctrine of immediate creation, something that Aquinas will not adhere to at all. In fact, Aquinas reaches back farther to the Libre de Causis and through the Libre de Causis to the Arabic, Plotiniana, Arabica, then to assert that, in fact, there is one creator. And he draws his description from that 9th century Baghdadi metaphysical material. Paragraph 13, quote, It is good, however, to call everything not coming into existence from a previous matter, not generated, but created, and to make the best thing called created, that which comes to be from its first cause without an intermediary, regardless of whether this first cause is material, efficient, or something else." Close quote. 
Here in paragraph 13, the term best thing is used, and it refers to the first created intellect as created, and anything coming into existence not from matter, according to Avicenna, should also be called created. The later implication for this is that creation is also then, as I already indicated, a term correct to use of immediate entities in the eminent hierarchy of giving existence to things. Paragraph 14, this creative agency is not done through a power or through matter, but rather is absolute. This is very important. It is not as it is in natural philosophy whereby the agents act, uh, act by a power other than the essence. The agent in creation acts immediately in virtue of its essence. That is, it, it acts through its very being, not through a power. And Avicenna says it's like the idea of heat. Quote, that which exists in itself is like heat, which if it existed separately and as an acting thing, then what proceeded from it would proceed simply because it is heat. Close quote. The idea, then, is that there's no distinction between the act, or operation, or power, and the essence, then this thing should act immediately in virtue of its essence. Or, as we saw earlier in the Arabic Plotinus material and the De Causes, it should act atata enai, to use the Greek, or be aniyatihi, to use the Arabic, through its very being. That is, once the agent is posited, then it does not wait and then act through something else, but when the positing of the agent means the positing of all that the agent does. So the notion behind this for Avicenna is, if you posit the existence of a first agent cause of all things, there's no reason to say that there would be any delay. Rather, there's reason to say that immediately upon the positing of the essence would follow all of the acts and all of the activities that the agent would do. There's nothing to hold it back because the agent does not have will. Furthermore, I think this is the implication for Avicenna, the notion that there is will and choice in the divine has to be rejected. And what else is rejected with that? The Christian notion of God's choice in creating the world. I think Avicenna is engaged with exactly that issue, and he wants to argue that the metaphysical conception of the agent present here, in fact, precludes the notion that the Christians have about the world. It precludes that the world is created in time in some way. Rather, the world is eternal, just as the agent of the world is eternal. Book 6, Chapter 3 draws out in detail the implications of this, and Avicenna summarizes his account at paragraphs 28 to 30. In paragraph 30, he concludes as follows, quote, The cause is thus more true than the effect. And because it is the case, that when absolute existence has rendered the existence of something, the latter becomes true. It is clear that the principle that, that bestow uh, the reality in which things participate has the greater claim to truth. Hence, if it is true that there is here a first principle, namely one that gives reality to others, it becomes true that this principle is the truth in himself. And it becomes true that knowledge of him is knowledge of truth absolutely. Next class, we will complete discussion of creation in Avicenna with careful consideration of metaphysics, book 8, chapters 1 through 5, with particular attention to chapter 3 of book 8, particularly at page 272, where he gives de a definition of creation related to the two earlier definitions he provided in Book two, chapter, uh, book 6, Chapter 2, at pages 203 and 204 of the Marmora Translation. In my discussion, I'll also consider Book 9, Chapter 1, and Book 9, Chapter 4, where he also makes some mention of the issue of creation. And finally, I note that we will not have class next week, but rather we will reconvene on the 27th of October, with our second full day of study of Avicenna. Thank you very much.